very warm welcome. Welcome to our Wednesday service and today we're going to be looking at God's resurrection power from Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 10. Well, as we come to God's word, let's pray to him. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the riches of your grace. We pray now that by your grace you would help me to preach your word faithfully. And we pray, Lord, that you would indeed transform us by your word, that we would trust in Jesus as our Saviour, and that your grace would change us, that we would walk in the good works that you have prepared for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, how do you experience God's resurrection power? How do you experience God's resurrection power uh, most of us are very aware of our need for God's powerful intervention in our lives. We recognize our own weakness, the power of sin and temptation, and the difficulty of living in this fallen world. And we, we long for God to powerfully and miraculously work to intervene, to bring breakthrough and renewal. Uh, many Christians seek God's resurrection power through miraculous healings or manifestations of spiritual gifts like speaking in tongues or prophecy. Now, other Christians seek God's resurrection power in a victorious Christian life, overcoming poverty, successful in their career and family. Other Christians seek God's resurrection power through victory over sin and temptation by the work of the Holy Spirit. Because of teachings like those, uh, we're attuned to think of God's resurrection power primarily in terms of material things, in healings and tongues and job promotions and money and the absence of suffering and sin in our lives. But is that the way that we experience God's resurrection power? But what does it truly look like to experience God's resurrection power? Well, that is our topic today as we turn to Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 1 to 10. And we've seen in chapter 1 verses 1 to 14, God's grand master plan for the world, stretching from eternity past all the way to eternity future. Paul prays God for all of the blessings that we have received in Christ, how he chose us to be holy and adopted us as his children and redeemed us from our sins and revealed to us his grand plan and, and guaranteed for us a heavenly inheritance. We saw that God's grand plan was to unite all things under the rule of King Jesus for the praise of God's glory. And last week in Ephesians 1 verses 15 to 23, we considered our response to those blessings. As we read Paul's prayer for spiritual insight, Paul prayed for us that, that we would grasp the fullness of all God's blessings for us in Christ. He prayed that we would know God better, that we would know our glorious hope, that we would know God's resurrection power, that he is working among us. Do you remember verse 19? He prayed that we will know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Paul prayed that we would know God's resurrection power at work in our lives, that same resurrection power that took Christ from dead in the grave and raised him to life and exalted him to heaven as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And today, chapter 2, we see how we may experience that resurrection power in our lives today. Well, if we are to understand God's resurrection power, we must first understand our spiritual state before we become Christians. We're at point one, our previous state, dead in sin. Our previous state, dead in sin. Look with me at verse one. All right, so you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Now, 
sin is not just the, the, the wrong things that we do, lies and, and, and greed and uh, lust and, and anger and things like that. We might call those sins. They are, they are trespasses and sins. But those things themselves are symptoms of a greater disease. And the disease of sin is rejection of God. Sin is when we say no to God and we want to live our own way, when we dethrone him and, and when we put ourselves and our own desires at the centre of our lives. Sin is how it is spelt, a little s, a little m, and a big I in the middle. Because sin is all about living for, for I, for me. And Paul says we were dead in our sins. Not physically dead, obviously, we're still alive today. Not physically dead, but spiritually dead. Dead in our trespasses and sins. Dead towards God, with no relationship with God, no future with God. We were like zombies, if you like. Physically alive, but spiritually dead. A spiritual death that would one day lead to a physical death. You see, the reality of death, that, that every one of us will one day die is a testimony to our spiritual state before God. Before we believe in Jesus, we are dead in sin. We are powerless to help ourselves. We, we have a spiritual death now. We will face a physical death later. And in this pre-Christian life, notice how our sin is expressed, verse 2. We were following the course of this world. Let's say we live in a world that lives, is against God, a world which lives for self and for pleasure and for other gods. We live in a world where religious people oppose Jesus and his people. We live in a world where atheists and secularists oppose Jesus and his people. And the world's antagonism shows through the world's priorities and values. The world's tribalism, the world's racism, the world's materialism, the world's self-dependence, and so on. We live in a world that is against God and his ways, and therefore full of trespasses and sins. And in our sin, in our previous state, we embrace the world's ways and, and the world's values and the world's religions, and we live that sinful life, failing to give honour to God failing to obey him as we should. And Ephesians 2 tells us not only were we following the world, but we were also in fact following Satan, the prince of this world. Verse 2 says we were following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. We're reminded that this world in which we live now is, is under the power of Satan. He, he wants us to rebel against God, and through the world... He influences us to do so, as the world's values and ways and religions tempt us away from Christ to live for ourselves. Now, in all this, we weren't just helpless victims. We were, in fact, also following our own sinful desires. Verse 3 says, Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. Uh, Paul is saying that this rebellion, this rebellious life, is something that every one of us lives willingly. Uh, we sin because that's what we want to do. Our, our natural makeup is to live for ourselves, to, to fulfill our own desires, to, to live for our own advantage. We struggle with greed and lust and anger and pride and, and all those other trespasses and sins because. Not just because those, those uh, things are out there in the world, but because they're lodged deep in our hearts. They are the desires of our hearts. We sin because we want to. We sin because we think our sins will make us happy. Or they will secure our future. Or they will bring us approval. The res what is the result of this way of life? following the world, following the devil, following our own sinful desires. Well, the result, verse 3, is that we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Every sin deserves God's judgment. And as children of wrath, we deserve to face God's righteous wrath, to be punished now with death in eternity conscious torment. If you've not yet put your faith in Jesus, if you're still following your own 
sinful desires, living for yourself in this world that is set against God and his ways, then understand this. Right now, you are dead in sin. Your relationship with God is broken. You're a child of God's wrath. You deserve God's judgment. You're physically alive. Spiritually, you were dead. Now, it's not that Christians are better off. Paul tells us this was all our state. All of us were dead in sin. But notice what it says. It says not that we were sick with sin. It says that we were dead with sin. Right? Sick people can call the doctor. Sick people can take their medicine. Sick people can do their bit to get themselves better. But dead people, by definition, are dead. They can't do anything. I've never been to a funeral in all these years where the dead person has participated in the service. And so being dead in sin means that there's absolutely nothing that we can do to save ourselves. It's, it's not a matter of trying harder or doing better, a, a little bit more religion, a little bit more morality. It's not about getting back on the right path as some religions teach. Being dead in sin means we can't do anything to save ourselves. We are dead and our only hope is God's powerful intervention to make us alive. So our previous state, we were dead in sin, now point to our new state, alive in Christ. Our new state, alive in Christ. Verse 4 begins with those marvellous words, but God, but God. Verse 1 to 3 says the subject is you. You were dead. You were following the world. You were following your sinful desires. You were a child of wrath. But verses 4 to 10, the subject is God. Look what God did. God did what you couldn't do. God made us alive. Look at verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. See, in his great love, God has acted to take sinful people like you and me from spiritual death to spiritual life. And that's the ultimate display of God's resurrection power. He took dead sinners and he made us alive. Just like Jesus was, was dead and God raised him to life and seated him in, him in heaven above every other ruler and authority. So God made us, who were dead in sin, alive in Christ and seated us with Jesus in the heavenly places. Well, how? How? Has God brought us to this new state? He, he saved us, verse 5. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Uh, salvation means rescue. Uh, a few years ago, a group of Thai schoolboys were trapped in a cave by rising flood waters. They were headed for certain death. They couldn't rescue themselves. But after a great rescue mission, 18 days later, the divers pulled them out from the cave alive. And so Jesus can save us and bring us from spiritual death to spiritual life. That's what the, the cross is, is all about. It was our sin that had broken our relationship with God. It was our sin that deserved God's wrath. But, but on the cross, Jesus took all of our sin and all of our punishment on himself in our place. On the cross, the sky turned to darkness as Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because there on the cross, he took the punishment that you and I deserve for our sins so that we could be saved so that we could be rescued from God's judgment. But notice in this passage, not only does uh, Jesus save us and make us alive, but he also seats us with him in heaven. Verse 6 says he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. 
Now, now what we see here is a doctrine called union with Christ. I don't know if you've heard of that doctrine before. Union with Christ means that when we put our faith in Jesus, we are spiritually united with Jesus so that we become one with him. It's like in marriage, right? When you say your marriage vows, the two become one flesh. Or when we put our trust in Jesus, we're united with him spiritually, the two become one. In, in, in marriage, one, both parties, they bring their resources, they share them with one another. And, and so, as we put our faith in Jesus, his death is my death. When he is raised, I am raised. When he is seated in heaven, we are seated in heaven too. In Jesus, we are blessed. In Jesus, we are adopted and forgiven. In Jesus, we are given inherit an inheritance, even though all of those things belong to Jesus. He gives them to us because we are united to him by faith. See, our union with Christ means not only that we're raised from spiritual death to spiritual life, but we are raised and ascended to heaven to share in his heavenly rule. Now, right now, that's only a spiritual reality. Physically, you and I, we're still here on earth. But spiritually, this passage tells us that believers are already with Christ in heaven, spiritually reigning with him. Now, all this means that the whole course of history has changed. No longer are we headed for wrath and certain judgment, but in the coming ages we will experience his grace and kindness to the full for those who put their trust in Jesus. We are blessed in heaven, not, not just with every spiritual blessing, but every physical one as well. Our previous state, dead in sin, our new state, alive in Christ. Well, how does that change take place from being a child of wrath to a child of God, from receiving judgment to receiving blessing, from death to life? We're at point three now, the change by grace, not works. The change by grace, not works. At the heart of every other religion outside of Christianity is the idea of works. You have to do the right thing to make God happy. If you follow the rules, if you pray, if you fast, if you meditate, if you do good works, if you go on a pilgrimage, then you will make God happy. Maybe you'll get good karma, or maybe you'll earn God's favour. But in Christianity, it's very different. Christianity is not about what we do, because of course, no amount of doing good can make up for the wrongs that we've already done. We were dead in our sins. But we are saved by grace. Did you see that all throughout this passage? Verse 4 says, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Verse 5 says, By grace you have been saved. Verse 7 says, In the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Those verses speak of God's mercy. Mercy is when God doesn't give us what we deserve, i.e. judgment. And it speaks of God's love, how God acts for our good and for our benefit. It speaks of grace as God gives us a gift that we don't deserve, that is salvation. It speaks of God's kindness, that is his faithfulness and his goodness. See, as people dead in sin, we, we couldn't earn salvation. We couldn't save ourselves. We couldn't do anything to, to, to move from death to life. But God gives us salvation as a gift. He gives us salvation not because of our goodness, not because of our obedience, not because of our morality or religion or our hard work. But he gives us salvation as a gift. He makes us alive because of his own love. His goodness, His mercy, His kindness, His overflowing grace. And verse 7 tells us that this immeasurable grace towards us will follow us for all eternity. His grace to us now means we're saved and we enjoy every spiritual blessing in the present, but His grace means for the future that we'll enjoy every physical blessing in heaven. We will forever live to the praise of his glorious grace. 
So it depends on God's love, not our goodness. Secondly, we see it's God's gift, not our work. God's gift, not our work. Look at verse 8. For by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. See, grace is what makes Christianity different from every other religion. Religion is spelt do, D-O, do. Every other religion is about what you must do. Follow the rules, pray, fast, meditate, do good works. Religion is spelt do. Christianity is spelt Done. Christianity is not about what you do. Christianity is all about receiving as a gift what Christ has done. See, it doesn't matter whether we've been baptized or confirmed, whether we serve on the parish council or we belong to a Bible study group, whether we've been praying for 11 days during thy kingdom come, whether we've been giving money to the church or helping the poor, whether we've been caring for our neighbours or evangelising the lost in Christianity Explored. None of those things are good works that are going to get you or I to heaven. They're all good things to do. But salvation is not by my work. Salvation is not by my effort or my merit. Salvation is God's work. Salvation is God's gift. Look again, verse 8. By grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Now, it was exactly this issue of how we are saved that lay right at the heart of the Reformation 500 years ago. All kinds of false teachings had crept into the Catholic Church. Heresies like this, God helps those who help themselves. Or obey God and he will give you grace. Or give money to the church and he'll give you a ticket to heaven. It was because of false teachings like this that made salvation by works that people like Martin Luther and John Calvin fought hard to recover the gospel of grace. The gospel that says we're saved not by our works, but by what God has done, we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Now, I think we often misunderstand what faith is about. Sometimes we think faith is a leap in the dark. But that's not right. Faith is based on evidence. That's, or we say faith is a religious feeling. I wish I had your faith. No, it's not a religious feeling. It's not a substance. In fact, faith is not particularly a religious word at all. Faith just means trust, dependence. It means putting your life in the hands of another. Trust, or faith, is what happens when you get into your grab car. You put your faith in the driver to get you to the destination. Your faith doesn't drive the car, doesn't get you there. But without faith, without trusting the driver and getting in the car, you'll never get to the destination. See, faith is like the open hands that receive a gift. Now, if I just open my hands like this, it's not going to make a gift magically appear, right? The open hands are just the mechanism to receive the grace. But without the open hands, I won't receive it, you see. So faith itself is not a, a work that I can boast about, as if on Judgment Day I can proudly boast. Well, I'm here in heaven because I had faith in Jesus. All those other people were too sinful to trust in Jesus, but I did it. I believed in Jesus, so I deserve to be here. No, faith is just trusting in what Jesus has done for us. And even faith itself, we're told here, is a, is a gift from God that he gives to us. Look at verse 8 again. By grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. Even our faith is a, is a gift from God. I can't boast before God. I'm here because I believed. And I certainly can't boast before others. I think I'm better than you, or more righteous than you. We are saved by grace through faith. Now, if you've really understood this, 
then there's always an objection that comes. If I'm saved by grace alone through faith alone, then surely it doesn't matter how I live. I can just do whatever I want, live for myself, because God's going to forgive me anyway. Now, if you make that objection, it means on one level you've understood grace. But on another level, you've misunderstood the goal of grace. You've misunderstood the goal of grace. Because not only have we been saved from something, but we have been saved for something. Look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him that we should walk in them. Here again, we're reminded salvation is God's work. We are his workmanship. But having been saved and recreated in Christ Jesus, we're now called to walk in good works that God prepared before us. Notice, good works don't lead to salvation. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Good works don't lead to salvation. But saving faith always leads to good works. Saving faith always leads to good works. Another way of putting it, good works are not the root of salvation. Good works are the fruit of salvation. Not the root, the fruit. So if we've truly understood, truly appreciated what God has graciously done for us, how he saved us when we were dead in sin, well, we'll turn away from that old life, living for ourselves, living for this world. We'll live a new life. A new life thankful for God's grace. A new life for Jesus our Lord. Just as God predestined us for salvation, chapter 1, so he's also predestined us for good works, chapter 2. We are to find the good works that he's prepared for us to do. And in response to his grace, in thankfulness for the salvation he's given us, we live a life for his glory. And so if we are a Christian and we haven't been baptised, we should get baptised. That's a good work God has prepared for us to do. It won't save us, but it's a response to grace. If we're Christian and we're not helping the poor, then we should help the poor. God's grace should make us generous to other people, but giving money to the poor won't save us. But it is a response to God's grace. And if we're a Christian and we're not engaged in ministry in a local church, we should get involved and, and serve other Christians. It's not going to save us. But it is a right response to God's saving grace. All these things and many more are good works that God has prepared for us to walk in. And later in Ephesians, we'll see many more good works that God has given us, our speech, our relationships, our love, our patience, all these things, all these good works are to be the fruit of salvation, our response to the grace of God, not the cause, but the result. We're saved through grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, but in response to God's grace, in thankfulness for what he's done, we live a new life for his glory. Well, let's return to where we began. Have you experienced God's resurrection power? Have you experienced God's resurrection power? I hope having looked at this passage, you see that I'm not, when I ask that question of you, I'm not asking, have you experienced a miraculous healing? I'm not asking you if you possess a particular spiritual gift. I'm not asking you if your career is successful or your family is happy. And I'm not asking you whether you're triumphing over sin in your life. When I ask you, have you experienced God's resurrection power? What I'm asking you is, have you been transformed by the gospel from someone dead in sin to alive in Christ? Have you received God's gift of salvation by faith? Have you changed from someone living for yourself, headed for judgment, to someone now trusting in Christ and, and headed for glory? For that is the immeasurably great power that he is working in us. He is bringing sinners from dead in sin to be alive in Christ, saved 
by his grace. Now perhaps you know this morning that you've not yet put your trust in Jesus as your King and Saviour. You're still trusting in yourself. You're still following the ways of this world and your own sinful desires. Still trusting in your own good works to get you to heaven. If that is you this morning, if you want to experience God's resurrection power in all of its fullness, put your trust in Jesus as your Saviour and King. Receive the salvation he offers. God will powerfully change you as he saves you from your sins, gives you new life in Jesus, and changes you to live for his glory. Now perhaps you're already a believer this morning. If that's you, please be thankful for God's powerful work in your life. Be amazed that he could save a sinner like you, that he can make someone like you one of his children. That is amazing power, isn't it? That he could change you and I. And if we want to see this resurrection power at work in other people, as we've been praying this week through in this Thy Kingdom Come program, then what should we do? We should preach the gospel of grace. Because as we preach the gospel of grace, that is when we will see God's power at work, bringing people once dead in sin, making them alive in Christ, saved by his grace, transformed by his glory. God's resurrection power, it happens as we preach the gospel of grace. Chapter 1, Paul prayed. He prayed that our eyes would be enlightened so that we would know God's resurrection power mightily at work towards us who believe. Paul prayed that because he wants us to grasp the enormity of what God has done for us in Christ. He wants us to appreciate how marvelous it is that he has saved us by his grace, that he's taken dead sinners like you and me, made us alive in Christ, and transformed us for his glory, that we might live for all eternity to the praise of his glorious grace. That is resurrection power. I pray that you will know it and experience it in its fullness. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your powerful work within us. Once we were dead in sin and headed for judgment, you, in your grace, made us alive. By grace, you have saved us. And you have given us new life in Christ. Lord, we pray that you would help us never to trust in ourselves or in our own good works to be right with you. Help us, Lord, to receive your loving grace as the gift that it is with thankfulness in our hearts. We pray, Lord, that your grace would indeed change us so that we walk in the good works that you have prepared for us to do. We pray this for the praise of your glorious grace. In Jesus' name, amen.